One can only imagine the wonder Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo felt as he sailed up the California coast in 1542 and gazed upon the enormous stone sentinel rising in the bay. He called the rock El Moro. Later, the bay would be named in its honor. But all that has changed. The rock is no longer an island. The creeks no longer run clear. The views no longer pristine. We've pushed nature's fast forward button, put the bay's survival in doubt. The danger signs have been there, but they were only seen by a handful of fishermen, scientists, and environmentalists. The late Jeff Fairbanks, editor, Telegram Tribune, October 1991. 25 years ago, when Jeff Fairbanks wrote these words, Morro Bay Estuary faced an uncertain future. In California, as in most of the United States and the world for that matter, estuaries have become more and more rare. Most of the wetlands like this in the state of California are gone. What is an estuary? Estuaries are places where the river meets the sea, where fresh water mixes with salt. So our Morro Bay is an estuary. Fresh water coming down from Toro and Los Osos Creeks mixes with the salty water from the Pacific Ocean. The 2,300-acre Morro Bay Estuary in San Luis Obispo County, midway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, hosts one of the most significant and least disturbed wetland systems on the central and southern California coast. Marshes and estuary habitat were considered wastelands in the past. Often they were filled in for land development, and scientists noted as human populations increased, coastal lands became more scarce and marshes dwindled, and so did the fish and bird populations. While Morro Bay has a small estuary system, it has a big impact on plant and animal species on California's coast. The estuary also serves as a nursery habitat, so it's a place where small fish start out their lives before they go out into the deep ocean and become commercially harvested fish. The bay was filling in with sedimentation, mostly caused by creeks draining from a 75 square mile watershed. You know, estuaries are at the receiving end of whatever is coming down the watershed, so in some ways it's natural, but it was uh, viewed as an accelerated problem. Uh, and when I, when I put together uh, historical uh, charts dating back into the 1800s, uh, it was really clear that we had already lost, in that period of time, you know, 20%. The problem was serious. It was estimated that the bay was filling in 10 times the natural rate. Every 10 years brought 100 years of sedimentation. A lot of our focus for um, sedimentation work had a lot to do with rangeland management. One of the first studies was conducted on Cal Poly rangeland. The study compared two watersheds, one as a control and the other with new range management practices and we had the rangeland manager at the time out there. And I was saying we wanted to restore the riparian on these creeks, and he said, well, they will never support riparian. They, they won't grow vegetation. And I said, Gary, turn around and look behind you, and behind us was county land where there were no cattle. And that, because of that, that whole area was a healthy riparian corridor. It's been really gratifying to watch how the whole rangeland program at Cal Poly has changed over the years to use those demonstration watersheds as sort of a core feature of their um, educational programs. Our grazing management philosophy is to have our cattle all in one bunch and move them on a regular basis. We're trying to replicate wild herds, such as buffalo, that migrated and, and uh, grazed and then were gone and rested the, and allowed the land to rest for quite some time. Uh, we don't use predators to do this, like the wolves, so we use fencing and water systems to actually keep our cattle bunched and move them along the rangeland that way. The rangeland creeks are also important for a very special fish, steelhead trout. They are born in the creeks, they migrate down into the ocean where they spend a few years and they grow to full size, and then as adults they return to the freshwater creeks to spawn. Unlike salmon, steelhead do not die after spawning. 
They will make the journey from creek to ocean and back several times. They need the creeks to be clean, to have enough water in them to support them through the dry summers. Um, they need the estuary because the estuary is, it provides this partially salty, partially freshwater environment for their bodies to adjust to that change before they migrate out to the ocean. And then of course they need ocean environments to be healthy so they can grow to full adulthood. The old reports I found in my fishing game files back in, at that time, um, actually old photographs made it clear that there was a very large and healthy steelhead population at one time in this creek. In 1966, the state government in Sacramento passed Resolution SR-176, stating that Morro Bay was an important resource for the citizens of California. This resolution prompted a study of Morro Bay's estuary. And a great plan was put out in, in 1974 that was just put on a shelf and never implemented. It was done by a consultant, and there was no local involvement. And in fact, the organization that paid $100,000 for it, never implemented their part of it either. By the mid-1980s, many governmental agencies were concerned for the survival of Morro Bay's estuary. The 1970s era report and the new coastal plan required action. San Luis Obispo County took the first step, and the planning department funded and created the Morro Bay Task Force. It had one part-time employee, Steve Ebry. We initiated what we called the Morro Bay Interagency Task Force, which was just all uh, various government agencies. We had a couple of meetings, and it became clear to me that we weren't doing much of anything, that everybody was involved uh, only in order to be able to protect their positions. To spur agencies into action, Ebri invited the public to the meeting. Attended by most of the environmental groups um, and a couple of the media, which also got a lot of the agencies upset. I got a call at 8 o'clock the next morning from Jean Cartwright, a, a real energetic woman, and she says, you know, what you need was an advocacy group uh, to support all of this. Friends of the Estuary was born and it soon became an important voice in the community. I have to tell you that it was the cheapest membership fee in the world. You could not go wrong, you could not say no. If somebody said to you, you gotta join the Friends of the Estuary, five dollars. First of all, we had to get some support going and PG&E helped us, this Friends of the Estuary group, to put on a membership drive and we got 2,000 members. With such a large membership, Friends of the Estuary could not be ignored. I had been on Governor Brown's original staff, his first term, and did a lot of legislative work. And the Friends of the Estuary, being a 501c4, we did legislative work, so we, any kind of lobbying. Along with the Friends of the Estuary, the Bay Foundation was formed. Bay Foundation was going to be kind of the business side of it, handling the funds, funding research that they, they would start doing, eventually funding the National Estuary Program. To educate the community, members of the Friends of the Estuary, the Bay Foundation, and the Morro Bay Task Force wrote more than 40 newspaper articles. Local papers showed their support. The New Times, the Sun Bulletin, and the Telegram Tribune printed the articles using the same masthead, State of the Bay. These articles in turn gave rise to the first State of the Bay Conference. And it was sold out, uh, 500 tickets, and, and it was full. Um, and, and including all of the um, field trips and whatever uh, attendance was, was 1,400 people in this two-week time. One conference was not enough to protect the bay. What Morro Bay Estuary needed was full-time support and funding. And, and somewhere along in this line, uh, came the realization that what we sh should be doing on a more permanent basis, and that's when I started looking at the various programs and identified the estuary program as probably the best uh, government syst system to become part of. The National Estuary Program was a natural fit for Morro Bay. Like the task force and the friends of the estuary, it used a collaborative approach. 
Well, the government established the, the National Estuary Program, and basically they wanted to clean up big areas like Hudson Bay and Chesapeake Bay, and we had to convince them that they needed one little tiny bay in their program to, as a, something to show how people could get things done. That program, for one thing, brings a lot, of, a lot of funds with it and staff and the ability to get grants. Um, and we were extremely disappointed when we didn't get into the program. Without federal recognition, fundraising was impossible. Even worse, it was the middle of a recession, money for the task force ran out, and Steve Ebrey was let go. Coming out of that experience, friends of the estuary and the foundation and others got together and we didn't want to give up at that point. So friends lobbied to create a new law in California, which would have Morro Bay designated as California's first state estuary. And with the hope that similar to the National Estuary Program, it would bring attention and resources to, um, to this area. And several years later, I think in 1995, I remember calling Dave Paradis and telling him, there's good news and bad news. The good news is they've, um, they're going to let us resubmit an application for the NEP, and the bad news is it's due in like two weeks. <laughs> the application required assembling material from dozens of agencies, writing a several hundred page document, and then bringing it before the governor for his signature. Part of what we were doing was imagining a structure. Now we had all these interested people, but how do you glue all these people together in an organizational structure that would be suitable and acceptable to the folks in Washington? To succeed in Washington, they enlisted the help of then-Congressman Leon Panetta. With his help, they were able to meet the demands of a complex program designed for much larger estuaries. So we worried about how we were going to put things together in the most financially effective ways. And that, that resulted in uh, Morro Bay being the first national estuary that uh, actually was built around a nonprofit. It was official. Morro Bay was part of EPA's National Estuary Program, one of only three designations in the state of California. This marked the beginning of a new era for Morro Bay. And it's lucky that, that if things like this survive at all, most of them don't. Most of them just sort of sputter out. But because of the leadership of, of people like Don Parham and Bill Newman and Steve Ebrey and, and others whose name are not coming to me right now, and I forgive me, uh, because there are a lot of them, uh, this would not have occurred with just the, you know, the, the will and leadership of one or two people. You know, it really did take a village. Morro Bay has participated in the National Estuary Program since 1995. Looking back, how has the designation affected the estuary? The estuary program designation was a long process. It was uh, the work of hundreds of volunteers giving thousands of hours over multiple years to get us to the point where we had this special designation, recognizing us on par with other estuaries like San Francisco Bay, Tampa Bay, and Puget Sound, just as important to our uh, clean waters and our, um, and our nation. It is important to understand the value of the estuary program. Though it's a part of the Environmental Protection Agency, it operates in a much different manner. I do want to mention something about the very early years with the people that joined the Friends of the Estuary. They had the idea that we were going to be able to protect this environment. And the NEP really doesn't do that. It has no regulatory control. I mean, we could watch somebody dumping oil out here somewhere, and all you can do is you can go to the fish and wildlife people and you say, is somebody out here doing a bad thing. The unusual non-regulatory nature of the National Estuary Program is the key to Morro Bay's successful conservation efforts. This allows collaborating with landowners and partnering with other agencies such as the Land Conservancy to solve problems. Most of the land that we have been able to um, uh, acquire and protect through conservation easements, a lot of it is still uh, 
owned by property owners, but there's conservation easement with very uh, strict limits on how it can be used. Other lands we have acquired and turned over to state parks or um, some other government agency. Uh, the Bay Foundation and the NEP really aren't in a role of protecting that land. Uh, we're looking at acquiring that and then setting it up so that it has protection. More than 4,000 acres within the watershed have been protected by the NEP and its partners. They have also restored over 400 acres of land back to its native habitat and the estuary built an educational center that draws 30,000 visitors annually. We've had more than 600 volunteers donate 18,000 hours of time to collect water quality data. This data is key to understanding the Bay's water quality issues of bacterial contamination and high nutrient levels. We need clean waters in order to support all the various uses that we would like to see happening in the Bay. And that includes shellfish farming, that includes recreational use like boating, fishing, swimming. Those things can only happen if we have clean water. One project that helps keep water clean is the Mutts for the Bay program that manages the installation and stocking of plastic mutt mitts used by dog owners to pick up their dog waste. There are more than 5,500 dogs in Morro Bay and Los Osos alone, which translates to 19,000 pounds of dog waste per week. Fresh water is another challenge for our watershed and estuary. And the estuary only exists, right, if you have fresh water coming down to mix with that salt water. And if users upstream um, are taking up all that water and not much of it is making it to the bay, then you're impacting the bay environment. So for instance, eelgrass is considered to be an ecologically important habitat type, but we've experienced drastic losses in eelgrass. More than 90% of the eelgrass has disappeared in the last seven years. This important underwater meadow is a place for animals to live, for fish to hide, and for birds to feed, especially the brant geese. The reason for eelgrass disappearance is not completely understood. And we've been doing a lot of work with partners like Cal Poly, uh, NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and other experts to try to figure out the cause of this decline and try out different ways of um, encouraging eelgrass to grow back. The problems that lay ahead are many and interconnected. Thanks to a passionate and dedicated group of people, Morro Bay's future is promising, and the previous warnings of devastation were averted. Today, Morro Bay's creeks run clear and the views are pristine. It is incredible what you see here in Morro Bay, and I think I just have to go back to the fact that there's so much wildlife here. It is so diverse. I've really, I've been, I've traveled all over the world, and it's incredibly rare to find this combination. The Morro Bay Estuary will be protected only if the community stays informed and involved. We need to educate ourselves and those around us so that the Bay will remain ours to enjoy well into the future. And it's going to be succeeding generations of children uh, who will rise to the occasion, I hope, uh, you know, to do the work that needs to be done to keep the Bay as healthy as it is and even healthier in the future. I think that we're doing really well with, our, with the habitat here. I think we're really doing well maintaining it, keeping it clean. It's still one of the cleanest bays in uh, California. This community has done a lot for this watershed and estuary because of the energy and love um, that drove a lot of people to take action. In some ways it's like a lovely little microcosm of how we wish, you know, our greater landscape could operate. That really is the ultimate way, I think, that we're, we will rediscover ourselves as, as Americans and solve problems that affect us communally. Inevitably, it's going to fill in whether we like it or not. Let's hope that it does it in 10,000 years and not in 10 years, which is the reason why we started all of this in the first place.